Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Edme, so much for the presentation. I'm gonna share my screen. A second. There we go. Can can you see the slide? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And well, again, uh, thanks so much for the presentation and. Um, Welcome to this. Uh, I, I've, I hope you find it as exciting as I do. Uh, so, um, well, this is this is a part of the research that I did for my dissertation, and this is basically the last part of it that came that has come out published, uh, and it came out this year. So it is the presentation, as as I said, is, is, is entitled "Catching the Whitefish, Gossip and Cocaine in Colombia's Northern Pacific Coast." My first encounter with the whitefish was in a three-wheeler taxi in a small village in Chocó, on Colombia's uh, Northern Pacific Coast. I had taken the seat in the back of the taxi, which two block in, blocks into our journey stopped to pick up two middle-aged local women. They both squeezed into the back seat next to me. I could tell that the driver, who seemed very formal when I first entered the taxi, already knew one of the women by the way they warmly greeted one another. We shared a one-hour ride together, and after some polite small talk, the driver began complaining about the current situation in the village. It's been many years since a fish has been so scared, he muttered, to which the woman replied. It's been many years since fishermen are so scarce, because fishermen are out trying a white fishing. To my ears at the time, there seemed an incongruity in the statement that there was not enough fish because fishermen were out trying to catch one particular type. To the untrained ear, the white fish is just another uh, creature of the sea. But for those who live in the coastal villages, it is a matter of serious concern as a transformation in practices and communal relationships takes hold of communities in this part of rural coastal Colombia. The whitefish is no marine being that consumes or reproduces in any biological sense. Rather, to my surprise, as one fisherman candidly expressed, it denotes a, su a substance that lies at the heart of much social, political and economic life across many parts of South America, cocaine. In this brief vignette that I, I just uh, related, uh, it is possible to see an array of meanings and context in the communication of cocaine trade realities. People employed the whitefish, el pez blanco, and the associated term white fishing, la pesca blanca, as ways to refer to the illegal economy of cocaine. In fact, this use of hidden meanings and discussions about third parties illustrates a variety of issues discussed by anthropologists working with gossip and rumor that appear conflated in a context of violence. First, there is the use of the whitefish as a metaphor, implying cocaine, uh, the, that delineates the shared group membership of the female and male interlocutors. I am an additional presence, a listener whom the other two parties find unfamiliar, which could explain why they resort to using a metaphor to exclude me. Second, it implies a normative preoccupation for the lack of an otherwise abundant food type. Third, possibly informed by anecdotal evidence, it communicates through a generalization the fishermen's whereabouts. Uh, gossips and rumors are employed in, in this research as gateways to examine narratives told candidly in interviews, small talk, and everyday converse, uh, uh, conversations in order to order to delineate the spillover economy of cocaine in the coastal villages around Utria National Park Choco. I approach gossip as a social practice through which people make sense and communicate their partial knowledge of salient relationships and events in which they're not necessarily directly involved. Gossip and rumor are not authoritative sources, nor they should be taken as such. What is essential to understand here is that in, in that the violent context, such as in Chocó, rumor with its uncertainty 
pierces a veil of fundamental reality that lies just beyond the reach of, of the researcher. This uh, research draws from ethnographic fieldwork conducted uh, for a total of six months in three stages between 2015 and 2016 on the coastal towns and villages around Utria National Park. Uh, Utria National Park is located in the northern Pacific coast of Colombia, close to the border with Panama. I can, uh, let's see if I can point here. Like here is Panama. Uh, the park is surrounded by villages that are flanked by the summit of the Serranía del Baudó mountain range, um, which isolates the area from the rest of the country, making it accessible, post, uh, accessible, accessible only by sea, by plane, or by walking for days through the tropical rainforest. The area is home to uh, Afro-descendant communities that live in coastal towns and villages outside the park as well as a minority of indigenous and Vera peoples who mostly live in villages in the rainforest, some within the park. Uh, houses in villages and towns are generally wooden, some are thatched, and others have zinc, cement, or tile roofs. The number of residents ranges from a few hundred in the villages to a few thousands in the towns. In this research, I only include materials pertaining to the Afro-descendant communities for two reasons. First, their villages are located in the coastal area, which is the scenario of drug trade. Second, I have no indication of the involvement of the Embera in this activity. Both the indigenous Embera and the Afro-descendant communities of Chocó share a common and entangled history of colonization, dispossession and violence since the arrival of Europeans half a millennial, millennium ago in order to exploit the region's riches. The indigenous communities are the descendants of those who resisted and survived the conquistadors' efforts to subjugate and enslave them. The communities of African descent are the progeny of people who were forcibly brought from Western Sub-Saharan Africa and Central Africa as slave labor for gold mines and sugarcane plantations located in the Pacific region. Uh, the mines were managed from the nearby cities uh, in the departments of Popayan and Antioquia. During uh, this time, some slaves managed to escape to remote places in the rainforest where they organized in small villages, some of them along the coast, while others had to wait until the colonial masters were forced uh, by the newly formed Colombian state uh, to emancipate their slave labor in the mid 19th century. The shared yet distinct history of colonization of both Embera and Afro-descendant communities permeates their contemporary life. For example, under the Colombian Constitution of 1991, both peoples are granted communal lands, the rights to prior and informed consent, among others. However, only indigenous peoples enjoy a separate legal jurisdiction and autonomous law. Awarded under a separate provision, which later became Law 70 of 1993, rights of Afro-descendant peoples allow communal management of lands and resources. These territories are managed uh, by a co a, an elected board of the Consejo Comunitario, Communal Council, that advocates for the defense of ancestral traditions and legal rights. However, the decisions of the board are not legally binding resting solely on the community's will to enforce them. For decades, Utria National Park and its surroundings have been a, a, a prime destination for ecotourism and whale watching. The local tourism industry is organized in ASOECO, Asociación de Hoteleros Ecoturísticos de Nutriqui y Vallasolano, a, a small association of ecotourism hotel owners which covers all tourism-related uh, production networks in the area, such as tour guides, hotels, restaurants, transport, agriculture, and fishing, among others. The association began in 1995 and expanded rapidly through international cooperation funds. The coastal villages by Utria had not been the scenario of armed conflict incidents until 2002, when kidnappings began reflecting disputes between state and non-state armed actors. 
Then a group of 80 tourists from Cali came for sports fishing. Uh, one local fisherman who I interviewed, uh, he was taking a group of tourists on his boat and he recalls the incident. Uh, since one of the trip organizers wanted, wanted his seven-year-old to see Utrias Inlet, which is in the picture, uh, my informant recalls, we're, we were just about to disembark and the guerrillas were just behind some bushes. They jumped on us, three on each side to catch the boats so we wouldn't leave. They said, this is, not, this is a kidnapping. I had never met a guerrilla in my life. I asked, what do you mean by a kidnapping? These people are just carrying 30, um, around $30 to pay for the trip. And I have the gas in my boat. We're just passing by. They, uh, they held us all until six in the evening. They took everything, the propellers from the motors and they poured gas on my boat to light it up. I said, no, please don't. If you burn it, I have no means to pay for it. If it's a rental, I'll go to jail. And uh, so they heard me and they stopped. They took 26 tourists and, they, and then came the downfall. Three years without a single tourist coming. Five years after, they would sporadically come. It was really dead. The ELN, Ejército de Liberación Nacional, National Liberation Army, guerrilla group, uh, kidnapped the park director together with the 26 tourists, holding them hostage for six months. The kidnapping was widely covered in the press at the time. Five years later, as tourism was starting to gain momentum again through the participation of uh, local representatives in national and international tourism fairs, there was another kidnapping of students and their teachers. Shortly after, the first paramilitary group arrived. Uh, paramilitaries are right-wing armed groups that are financed both by large landowners and drug trafficking activities acting in opposition to the guerrilla groups and many times they've worked in collusion with the army. Colombia has been the world's top producer of cocaine for over 20 years and therefore a main player in the war on drugs. You can see here in, on, the, on the chart on the right side uh, that Colombia, Peru and Bolivia account for the majority of world's production of cocaine. The majority of the country's armed conflict, including cocaine production and trafficking, has take, taken place in rural areas. Uh, despite this com the complex security landscape usually associated with drug trafficking that includes violence and state repression, during the time of my fieldwork I found a markedly different situation in the villages surrounding Nutria National Park. People leaving their doors and windows open every day, everybody greeting each other, buoyant uh, commerce and bored policemen playing on their mobile phones when they were not flirting with the local women. Not the type of situation one would expect in an area with armed conflict and drug tra uh, trafficking. If in general local people seem worried about occasional, pe uh, occasional petty theft rather than, as I expected, drug-related violence, in what ways was this situation possible? The cocaine that reaches Chocó arrives on speedboats from the country's uh, southern departments of Putumayo and Nariño, where, uh, where, where coca is farmed, processed uh, into cocaine and packed and sealed in plastic in the form of bricks. Uh, here in the pictures we can see <clears throat> this is what this uh, coca farms look inside the rainforest. Uh, here we can see on the coastal area, uh, this is a submarine caught by the army. And this is uh, the coastal area of Chocó. In 2005, cocaine production peaked for the first time at approximately 800 tons of cocaine per year. After the 2005 peak, cocaine production declined until 2013 when it once again started increasing to approximately 1,400 tons of cocaine by 2017. The ports where cocaine comes from are located over 200 kilometers south 
uh, from Utrea. Uh, traffickers use speedboats, submarines, and small air aircraft to move cocaine uh, towards the north along these trafficking routes. So heading to Central America, to Mexico, and to reach the US and Canada. The whitefish implies a special relation between fishermen and cocaine. Uh, the whitefish arrives by chance when the authorities pursue and occasionally sink the speedboats of drug traffickers. During pursuit, sometimes traffickers drop, pack, drop off packs of cocaine into the open sea, hoping they can recover them later. From these drifting packs of cocaine, fishermen sometimes catch the white fish with their traditional fi uh, fishing gear, just like they would catch any other fish on the sea. Some of them set sail actively looking for it, others happen upon it by chance. Fishermen interpret the winds and the currents uh, they are so familiar with, albeit not always with success. People refer to these fishermen wittedly as fishermen of hopes. Pescadores de ilusiones, alluding to the high expectations and low probability of actually actually finding the white fish instead of pursuing a, an actual fish catch. A fishermen, sailors, and coastal residents a, have to learn to navigate through this drug trafficking context by making a, by being able to read the constantly changing dynamics of a, the drug trading routes. The northern part of Chocó, by the border of Panama, serves as a strategic corridor connecting the Pacific and Caribbean basins. Guerrilla paramilitary groups and drug gangs have disputed regional control for years. Organized crime structures transport and smuggle the cocaine from southern producing regions towards Central North America. These structures are said to have inherited the business from now extinct paramilitary groups according to a report from the Ombudsman office. In the coastal area where I did my research, the only armed actor currently present is called Autodefensas Gaitanistas de Colombia, AGC. Uh, their presence can also mean violence for people that get caught in these networks. For example, one informant discussed with me the presence of paramilitaries and how she and her brother were threatened by them. They live both of them live on a paradisiac uh, location, you know, an island, which is also very exposed and used by traffickers. Hence, when the paramilitaries came, they thought they could, uh, well, they thought that both, both of them were complicit with some other rival trafficking group and asked them if they knew where this other group had uh, stashed some cargo with the unfortunate consequences that this visit meant that uh, her brother was beaten up. That said, some, some other coastal residents, they managed to avoid the drug traffickers and do not find their presence problematic so long as such uh, routes remain hidden and do not interfere with their regular lives. Nevertheless, the active presence of the military indicates a delicate balance. Several times I found groups of soldiers camp camping in the rainforest around the villages. Moreover, one early morning, one of the villages where I was staying at uh, had soldiers in every single corner. When asked about their presence, the soldiers said they were on a military operation against drug traffickers. In the villages, people say that mostly young fishermen are actively looking for the white fish in the sea. There are also rumors that many people have become involved in organizing shipments towards Central America, including teachers and local officials looking to make quick profits. Uh, the government classifies the region of Chocó as the poorest, uh, as if not the poorest in the country, with 59% uh, of the local population living in poverty conditions, with monthly incomes below $66 per person, and 34.7 under extreme poverty, that's below $1 per day. Hence, opportunities for improving one's quality of life, such as those granted by the whitefish, which are measured 
in hundreds of thousands of dollars can seldom be disregarded. While the lack of opportunities is very problematic for any newcomer, there is an overall impression of prosperity in the villages that stands in stark contrast to both governmental statistics and the lack of job opportunities. In the area, I have frequently found new buildings, new cars, restaurants where the food was sold out, and people who always found reasons to celebrate with gigantic loudspeakers. In most villages, people readily display their new electronic gadgets, which included computers, televisions, sound systems, smartphones. Uh, some new cars and a few pickup trucks move through the dirt roads. Everyone appears to be benefiting from these contingent prosperous times. For example, one informant explained to me that there were rumors that uh, the owners of some shops uh, in town had invested their white fishing earnings in expanding and improving their businesses and bringing new products to sell. Uh, in reality, it is challenging to discern the incomes generating from whitefish from that resulting from other types of economic activities, as they may be as they may benefit indirectly from increased spending resulting from the general uh, prosperity. Uh, another example was a, a neighborhood, a, a neighbor uh, from where I was staying, uh, he told me that one that uh, of course this is why I speak about rumors but that uh, one of his neighbors had received a large payment uh, for some packs he uh, some packs of cocaine he came across when he was returning from uh, retrieving fisher gear late in the afternoon as it was a substantial amount of cash his neighbor buried it in one of the villages uh, uh, sorry in one of the beaches near the town a few months later he returned dug out his treasure of banknotes only to find it rotten and destroyed by moisture. Choco is one of the rainiest places on the planet. Uh, my informant la laughed out loud when he told me this story. Now, he, when he sees his neighbor, he teases him by calling him the poorest rich man in the village. Other stories recall how locals came across the whitefish, uh, spent their money on large quantities of expensive liquor to the point that some people showered with whiskey, bought new cars, others uh, rented airplanes to go partying to Cali, Kibdo, Medellin, which are cities uh, nearby. During my time in the villages, I also expected at some point to run into stranded packs of, of cocaine at the beaches. Needless to say, I never saw or found anything extraordinary, only regular drifting wood and plastic bottles. Despite the allure of these stories, not everyone considers the emergent economy of cocaine as an appropriate way to make a living and use rumor and gossip to express their uneasiness with it. This is the case as some see uh, the whitefish as transforming traditional livelihoods and eroding local institutions. For example, in the rumors pertaining teachers and public officials financing cocaine shipments towards Central America. Others worry about the long-term effects on community building activities. Uh, for example, Maribel, who runs a small restaurant uh, targeted at tourists and splits her time between farming and uh, working at her restaurant. Uh, she told me during interviews that uh, she was concerned about the deeper effects that uh, the cocaine economy is having on people's motivation to participate in communal practices. So uh, she recounted to me, many people left the fields, stopped fishing, and then one day when the white fish is over, when these, day, these days there is nothing left at sea, it's like they want to return to work, but not really. But there is nothing like tilling the earth every day. This way you are more in contact with your neighbor and with one another. But when one finds $30,000, you don't go to the fields or go fishing. Her words depict with a normative undertone a situation where the promise of becoming rich is a bigger motivation to spend 
one time at, uh, at sea than working in fishing or agriculture, which provide a secure income and reinforce a particular type of traditional farming labor institution. Typically, in Afro-descendant communities in this region, neighbors uh, work collectively on each other's plot of land, farming yuca, plantain, and rice. Labor is compensated through mano cambiada, hand exchange consisting of regular rotations from farm to farm in which food amenities during the day's work are provided by the host. The same cooperative relations exist among fishermen, for example, by sharing the catch or helping one another to pull out the fishing lines. The whitefish has affected the interrelations among community members, on undermining not only traditional social relations, but also the efficacy of the board of the Consejo Comunitario which, uh, as you may recall, I explained at the beginning, that is part of a, a, an outcome of the, the 19, uh, 1991 constitution, which extended some legal protections to Afro-descendant communities and has, as part of its role, advocate, uh, to advocate for and defend uh, these communities' legal rights. One of a uh, one community leader lamented to me, with the coming of the whitefish, everybody becomes the law. I get some pesos and then I've seen to myself. Like we say, no one can raise their voice to me. Then the law appears, which is the real law. People involved may say, look, here, take this money and keep quiet and leave me alone. So let's say it's a phenomenon that distorts the whole of the positive image that we've wanted to have of the community. At present, the very legitimacy and efficacy of the Consejos Comunitarios is in question. People involved with the whitefish perceive them as threats to their newly acquired power. Luckily, there have been no incidents yet. As conclusions, uh, well, rumor and gossip about the whitefish reveal at least four aspects regarding the uh, reality lived by local communities. First, we learned that the articulation of the whitefish is specific to a context in which it is not possible, possible to talk openly. People talk quietly, secretly, candidly, and wittily. Second, that uttering uh, of the whitefish generates new meanings, both for the fish and for the cocaine. White alludes to the color of cocaine, disregarding the color of the packaging, which is usually black. And fish, uh, here is no longer an animal, that is, uh, and the act of fishing is no longer the pulling of an animal out of the water. Third, we see that traditional livelihoods such as fishing, farming, and tourism are not meeting the local expectations of paid labor, and instead are being crowded out by white fishing. And fourth, it is clear that opportunities for jobs and creating enterprises are very much limited by historical circumstances and structural circumstances. Hence, the white fish grants a new possibility of making a living by transforming and generating new practices and relations. Yet, this is viewed as undesirable from the perspective of social movements and community building processes. In sum, a rumor and gossip about the whitefish shows that in context of violence and exclusion, like many where a contemporary anthropologists are working in, the tension between a, what we're able to observe and what we hear a, is, is, is relieved, what we're, we're able to discuss these issues. And a, we can have an insight into an otherwise concealed reality. Thank you. Thank you, Glass. And uh, very, very interesting. Now we see, we are going to see if we have any anybody who wants to raise any questions. You can do that within the chat or within the questions and answer as you wish. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> so the share, I just. 
Yes. Well, when we wait for the people to to raise the questions, I'm sure that the, there will be some. I, I, I have my own questions as well regarding your research. Uh, what, what was your motivation to start this kind of research? What were you looking for from the beginning? This, this was not the main focus of, of my dissertation. This mm -hmm. is something that I happened to come upon. Mm -hmm. I do my research mostly on a political ecology, so I was more interested at the beginning on the relations of both the Afro-descendant community and the Embera with the National Park. And this was something that was becoming a, a very important local livelihood. So I just, I mean, people were talking about it and it was uh, somehow pervas pervasive and contradictory. So I thought this is something that I need to find out more. And, and continue with that conversation. You said you were interested in uh, Afro descendant communities and, yes. and indigenous people there. Um, you know, of course, and have read what uh, Arturo Escobar has written on these issues because he has dedicated a lot of him to these uh, regions as well. Yes. And something which he writes very much about is um, the, pol the possibility of finding alternative ways of development uh, regarding communities, organizations in this region. Uh, do you, have you found anything like that? And then we go to the question. Um, I think, uh, okay, I'm, I'm trying to organize my thoughts. Uh, let's talk first about Arturo Escobar's work. So his, his research mostly focuses on, on the southern part of the Pacific coast of Colombia. So mm -hmm. uh, where there is proper, I would say, development with capital D. So there's a uh, shrimp companies, there are a uh, palm oil. This area, there's no su such thing. I would say that the only big thing as development is, of course, the, the national park as a way of uh, the state taking control of space. Uh, um, I think part of what has happened with the national park is that uh, in a way has created a whole, uh, a whole range of local livelihoods and part of part of them can be seen as alternatives to development others maybe not so much it it's it's not so clear i wouldn't say that it, this community has a a unified or a specific idea of what they would like to do with a for 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 the future mm. um i don't know if that answered the question mm. now you can go to the chat you have we have two ah. questions here and um one of them the first one is how did you come in contact with these specific communities what was it generally like for you to gain access to the data that you gathered um that's like <laughs> I've, I've had that that uh, a similar question before um uh, thank you for the question i i think uh, I, I went to field, I already had some, some contacts in the area before I started doing my, my field work. So that kind of allowed me to have access. Uh, I basically just, just by being there and following snowball, snowballing method with contacts that I had, I had more access to more people and to different kinds of uh, economic and activities and, and livelihoods, which was my, my main focus. Uh, what was generally like for you to gain access to the data that you gather? Yeah. 
Um, what was it? I, I don't I don't quite get a, the, the question. Uh, it wasn't difficult for me to gain the, the data if, if maybe in, I can try to answer in that sense. Mm. I at least not not with the Afro-descendant community. With the Embera, it was a different story. Uh, at the beginning, like I, it took me at least a year to be able to have a, a access to their community and to, to be able to talk to them and interview them. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not part of, of this, uh, this presentation, but I can talk about it. Mm -hmm. And first they asked me for a letter and then I went to visit, came back, then they visited me at the hotel where I was staying. Then it, it, was, a, it was a long process and it took months and months. With the afro Senate community, it was a lot easier, mostly also because my contact is, is from there. I hope mm -hmm. I answered the question. The second question is, uh, you can read it yourself. Okay, so it says, I, from Alexandre Diarte, I lived in Choco, uh, sorry, I lived in Kibdo and working with the Coco Masia and Coco Mopoca. Consejos Comunitarios in Chocó, Nazaregua, and Vera people. Great. Their experience, uh, what they told us, is that the land is very important and that the political power around former President Uribe in, in some cooperation with all oligarchies were behind much of the violence that take their land and enable the expansion of uh, the drug business. What was your experience around that link of power, drug business? Um, okay, this area around Utrecht National Park, it doesn't have a such a big land conflicts in the sense that in most of the land titling was done around 90, was it, in the 90s. Like I think the last, the last title is from, if I'm not wrong, from 1999 when the Consejo was, was formed. So uh, there is, and, and these are communal lands which cannot be subdivided and they cannot be sold. So they belong to the community. Uh, with the relation of drug trafficking in, uh, in this area, I would say that have been two waves, one prior to 2005, where drug traffickers uh, bought some of the, the few plots of land that were not collectively owned and a part of money laundry operations. Uh, the second wave, which is more connected to the whitefish, uh, the money has been, let's say, so, uh, redistributed somewhat in, in the local context. Uh, the presence of, like form about the relationship between a uh, president Uribe and paramilitaries and the drug power business, the drug business. Uh, the paramilitaries that I mentioned, the, 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 the first group that arrived in 2007, uh, the local community didn't allow them to settle. The, the local Afro and they, they they kicked them out uh, when they tried to the, the, their presence lasted only for like six months because people started calling the authorities started uh, seeing basically like excluding them and uh, working with the authorities so they managed to avoid having that the wave of paramilitarism from the uh, 2000s, mm. uh, which was also when a president, former President Uribe was around, was in power. Mm. So somehow they, they skipped that. They were very, I would say, brave and, and lucky. Mm. Oh. Mm. Mm, the link. In, in question and answers, you have two other questions from Gloria. Uh, to hear you, how dangerous it is to research this kind of issue in the field in Colombia. And I'm thinking of cartels, paramilitaries, maybe 
uh, you feel threatened or are you afraid for your safety? Uh, I found the, the, the question. Uh, not yes and no. I mean, I think um, I think I was I wasn't researching drug trafficking as such. I was researching like what was happening around it. So I, as I said, I never had contact with uh, drug traffickers, or I never saw cocaine or any anything that I would be concerned or any legal activity. I what I collected were stories of people discussing this issue, which was to a certain degree pervasive. Um, uh, my idea, of course, was not also no, not I, I, I guard the, or the, the identity of all my informants and everything is pseudonymized to avoid possible issues or traceability. Uh, but this is this issue of, uh, of, of, of whitefish and all drug trafficking in this area is, is um, somewhat hidden. And, but people know about it and they discuss it and they, it's, it's, it's a common speech of everyone, something that people have in, in their minds. Um, and no, I, I, I wasn't afraid in any sense. Uh, I think this, um, how do I explain why? Like the, the area is, is, is safe. Like I, as I said, like I, I was expecting a very different story from reading when that, that was when when you hear about uh, drug trafficking and drug violence and all this in, in this area, which simply didn't exist as such, like as as visible as possible. Also, the area has a big military base, uh, so there is a strong presence of the military, and well, maybe in collusion or despite that, there is. There are these trafficking networks happening. Um, I still think that yeah, one can do research in these areas where there are presence of of, of drug traffickers. I think um, I don't know from reading the experience and talking to other anthropologists that have worked in other parts of Colombia. Uh, yeah, there are ways of conducting research, like. Uh, for me, at least, I I avoided spending more than three months consecutively in the field to avoid calling, like bringing too much attention to me. But that was just in general, not because I was doing this research, but just because uh, this, I mean, the, the history that the area has, and to you know, and to avoid being perceived as someone that is just asking too many questions or hanging out here for too long and also uh, endangering maybe my informants by being there. So all these considerations were there, but not, not, not because the topic as such, bec but because these are uh, complex uh, areas to do research in. I, I hope I answered the question, Gloria. Yeah. Uh, I, I also have a question, Nicolas, and that is about, um, also about safety, but in a different way. You mentioned the kidnappings and the ELN. And we know that the FARC has laid the weapons down, but not the ELN, because the negotiations have not been so successful. So are they still there? Um, it's complicated right now. So I, I've been following what has happened. So the, the area, the ELN came to this area early 2000s, then there was paramilitaries, then they left. Uh, ELN has a strong presence in Choco, like in the whole department. Uh, but there's been a lot of disputes with these neo paramilitary groups, and it's all connected to drug trafficking. So it's about who controls these uh, rents from drug trafficking. 
Um, Yelen, yeah, as, as you said, uh, the, this process with them was unsuccessful unsuccess and in part because of the current government that we have in Colombia that basically uh, cancelled uh, the, the peace talks and even accused Cuba, which was the facilitator of harboring terrorists and not giving them to Colombia, which is absurd. I mean, it's absurd because they they're the intermediary. Um, yeah, I, I, the, the situation, as in many other parts of Colombia, it's, it's, it uh, is fluid. Many parts of rural Colombia that uh, it's not, it's a low intensity civil war in mm. a way. It's like things happen, but sporadically happen. Not. Mm. But, but there are no, no uh, risks for new kidnappings of tourists or things like that? Kidnappings, not anymore. I think it was, there is, there is, um, oh my God, I forgot her name, who writes about this. That how it was kind of like the like fashion that suddenly everything was kidnappings in Colombia during, during the 90s. So it was FARC that were kidnappings, we were doing kidnappings, there were uh, ELN, paramilitary, uh, uh, criminal gangs, everyone was kidnapping. Mm. And of course, awful. I mean, I, I, I don't want to, to take away any. Like, anything from it and it's, it's an awful situation but uh, it is not as it used to be right by far mm. it's a, like the, the numbers of kidnappings is virtually non-existent in comparison of what it used to be I don't have the numbers but mm. so I that's does that answer the question yes so so you have more tourists coming now Yes, yeah, the area is super active for tourism. It's very, very active. Uh, they do, uh, well, visiting the park. The park is beautiful. Uh, the, the high season is around August, because it's when the whales come. They come from Antarctica to have their babies in this area. So you get to see the whales, like the moms with the, with the calves, mm. the little whales and yeah, it's very pretty and i would say that there's also a lot of people coming during uh, the holidays like uh, during christmas because it's the dry season so um yeah it's, it's really nice because mm -hmm. it, it rains a lot in the area it's like the the first or second rainiest place on the planet it's a lot of rain like could be a week without stopping. Oh, you have another uh, question here. How does your this experience have changed your view about Colombia's reality? I mean, like a sense of an alternative reality. That's the question. <laughs> um. Okay. Um. I don't think has changed it. I mean, I, I'm from Colombia. I think it's maybe a bit of the perception of of a region. Um, I've also done research in, uh, in the Amazon. I worked in the Llanos region for many years, which are also areas that have been affected by the country's armed conflict. Um, I don't take away from, from uh, these areas, oh, like, the history and the, the complicated context that in which they are which they are so uh, all the problems of violence uh, the armed conflict itself but uh, as i said i think it's like to to understand what happens in rural colombia is is more of a a low intensity conflict so uh, i hope that answers the question mm. um. Sí. Gloria is making a comment because she says that she would like to make something like a research in Mexico, but that she considers is very risky. I, I think it's more risky in Mexico than what you 
Maybe. Right in Japan. It's also about the focus. It's a bit like a one of one of my supervisors said to me, it's like you don't you don't look at the sun because it will blind you, mm -hmm. but if you want to look at it, you look from the side. So you can do research in an area, or you can look at the illicit stuff that is happening, mm -hmm. and get a, an idea of the illicit. So without endangering yourself, of course, like that's yeah, one, one shouldn't risk oneself for research or anything, really. But I'm afraid the situation in Mexico is much more risky. Everything I that's what I've heard. Uh, we have another question. Have the whitefish phenomenon affected the prices in the area like cocaine transport has affected other parts? Um, in terms of inflation, mm -hmm. I guess. Yes, of course. And I mean, something that struck me was that the, in, in these villages is like, you may find, I don't know, four or five restaurants in the entire village of 10,000 people. And they would be sold out. Like if you went at 1 p.m., they would out of food, for example, mm -hmm. or like certain stores also like completely sold out. And it was not because they didn't have access to getting products, but because of the fast economic activity that that's happening because of, of this massive influx of, of cash. So it is, uh, I, I, I cannot tell about uh, like inflation as such that would require a, a different kind of study, but I, yeah, from, from my perspective, I, I think it has had an effect. I cannot tell the extent of it. But the people don't complain of inflation. Not yet. But I think also also because, um, I mean, th things are pretty expensive in, in, in this area because what isn't farmed locally is brought by a boat from the south like 200 kilometers by boat or flown. So things are already expensive in comparison to other parts of the country. Um, so the few cars they're brought by boat, uh, I don't know, like some, some vegetables that they don't farm are brought by boat. Um, I would say that the, the other thing, and as, as I had as opening a vignette was that the scarcity of fish in these fishing villages because there are no people fishing. Uh, so it is a, a phenomenon that one can relate to a problem with supply and demand. So maybe the prices are too low for, <laughs> for the amount of uh, fishing. I don't know. Mm. Uh, I have another question. You spoke about where goes the money. And first, how do they convert these white fish into money? Do they sell it to, to the to drug dealers? So that, that is one of the questions. The other one is about money laundering. Because, I mean, in such a small scale, perhaps it is not so difficult, but money laundering has been one of the big problems in Mexico as well. So, yeah, so I, I guess I, I forgot to mention that, but what, the, what happens is that on, when, when the traffickers send these boats towards the north, like, usually at night and when the sea is calmer, eh, they put people, one or two people per village and packed with cash. So if the authorities stop them or in, try to intercept and they drop the, 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 the packs of cocaine to, at the sea, then and if fishermen find it, these people can buy it back immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course, what, what happens with the money? So, so a lot of it goes into consumption and a lot of these uh, uh, local 
well, small villages. Uh, is, uh, the whole economy of rural Colombia, I would say, is, is informal economy. Mm. And if you're a big land owner, you're, it's likely that you're, uh, I don't know, receiving state subsidies as a poor person, as I've seen in other parts. <laughs> it's, it's terrible. Mm. And it shouldn't have happened, but that's... So, so there is a lot of money, cash around, and a lot of things that, yeah, they, they don't even use the banking system because there are some taxes in Colombia per transaction through the banking system. So a lot of commerce and a lot of uh, transactions happen in cash, like hand by, uh, hand-to-hand transactions. Mm. They they don't they don't invest in productive issues only consumption. Some people do so. Some have expanded their businesses. Others I I found out that some people have I don't know bought houses in the cities and have them rented out as an alternative income. Uh, other people redo their houses. Other people just yeah as as consumption so buy cars and appliances and. Uh, there's all sorts of things, but I think this is the tip of the iceberg. I hope I'm able to get more funding to look more into this. Mm. this is, I, I think this is the appetizer. <laughs> there's another question now. Uh, is there any tension between people involved in the white fish business and those who are not? I think about the growing difference in income and lifestyle. I think I cannot tell exactly. I think um, it's very complicated because you could have a business, a legal business, like for instance, um, a shop that sells construction material, right? And suddenly your business starts booming because there's more cash and these people want to, re like the people involved in, in, with the whitefish, want to redo their homes. So your licit business, you're doing really well. Same if, if these people don't, don't want to, I don't know, cook at home and they prefer to go to restaurants. So you're doing really well. Uh, so it moves the entire economy and, uh, and all the, with, with a lot of ramifications. Uh, that said, there are, of course, people that don't agree with this uh, type of uh, livelihoods or new livelihoods. And I would say part of it is, is about the morality of, of these economic activities. Part of it has to do with, of course, the, the violence that has to happen as an illegal activity. Uh, I, I wouldn't say so much so far in terms of lifestyle uh, because everyone, I mean, they all live in the same village. So it's like some people do a little bit better, some don't. And if by some reason you decide to, I don't know, pull together uh, with other people some, some money to pay for a fisherman to be at sea trying to find a cocaine packs, then you're going to get some profits without being there. So there is a lot of interconnections that are not so clear. I hope that answers the question. And for how long have you been studying this? I mean, the communities, etc. I, I did. This was uh, 2015 to 2018 and I'm planning to go back next year with a new, new project because I, my previous postdoc was in, uh, I did I, I, that I, uh, the previous pro postdoc that I did was in uh, in the Amazon the previous project so I'm I'm planning that the next one I go back to Chuko and there's more there's more to be done there's more to be said there are more more things happening i don't think there's any other question i i also have a question about 
migration. Do you find that from these communities, you also have migration to the cities? Yes, and you see it during uh, holidays that a lot of the people that are in the cities, they come back. So suddenly the towns have, I don't know, four times the population. Mm. And uh, well, uh, the festivities, not those called the holidays, but, but local festivities or when there are elections also. So a lot of people come back to vote because uh, you have to vote in presence. Uh, there is no postal voting in Colombia. Mm. So uh, yes, there's a lot of migration. There is um, yeah, there, there, there are no jobs simply and the conditions aren't great either um yeah uh, and and a few of the villages have electricity the others have a is intermittent the service like works a few hours a day things like that like it's it's not it's it's really pretty to visit but i understand that living can it, it implies a a set of uh, complicated things so I understand why some people would like to leave uh, and go elsewhere. Mm. But do they send any remittances to these villages? They do, and there is a lot of connection. Well, it's migration to, within Colombia, mostly. And some, some people have, I don't know, well, the people that have, that are well off, is have houses in the main cities uh, and some have some family members living there sometimes. Uh, there are, of course, uh, some remittances that come that come back, but uh, most of the people also do part time agriculture in the communal lands. Mm. So it's not it's, it's a, a you don't need a lot a lot to live with you know you can buy, um, all you need is your your labor basically mm. tourist activity in the area is it provided by local companies or are there national or even inter- transnational companies involved mm. uh, mostly it is provided by local entrepreneurs there are a few uh, high-end this no there's only one high-end uh, hotel uh, which is not local the other ones are all local or were, were local i don't know exactly what it looks like after the pandemic i i really hope they still exist of course uh, with the lack of tourists the past year i mm-hmm. i don't know and do you know that if these communities were affected by covid yes everywhere uh, but it wasn't in this area wasn't as bad i don't know why or they didn't report it as much mm. i don't know I've, I've been following and been in touch but uh, uh yeah well, he's not as bad as the rest of, of colombia yeah i think it's they're they're pretty isolated in a way, mm. it's, uh, it's, 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 it's not that easy to get there. So, uh, and, and it's not that many people that live in, that live in these areas, mm-hmm. which is also good. When you mean pretty isolated, it means that you don't have roads coming there? There are no roads to get there. So you can you only you can get there flying or by boat or you could do like walking like three days through the rainforest mm. to get there. That's that's uh, so 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 the, the trafficking from cocaine you said it's by boat or by only, plane? Only mostly by by boat. There's some by plane, but it's mostly mostly by boat. Boats and, and submarines. And uh, it's all marine trafficking. It's nothing inland, at least in this part, because uh, the the mountain range 
which just makes it very inconvenient for for traffickers to cross it. So it's easier just to go by sea. Mm -hmm. And there is no coca farming either. This is mostly, it's just trafficking. Um, there are similar reports of people finding packs of cocaine in other parts of the world as well. Mm. And which I'm writing a project about, so I hope I get the funding for that as well. Mm. But, uh, yeah. There's nothing else. You mentioned um, actors in the area. How do you, do the tourist activity relate to them? Are there threats or taxes? I lost, I, I lost you, Did, or maybe... This is the last in the, in the, in yes. the chat. Hey, how do you tourism relate to... Okay, my, I think saying my connection is unstable. I'm sorry about that. Um, it's a complicated question. Um, I think, I mean... I don't think they're paying like, taxes to uh, arm actors right now. I think they did back in the in the notice, but not not right now in in, in like early two thousands. Uh, at least and not in this area. Uh, and of course, this has been an issue all over Colombia: extortion and making businesses pay to armed groups, um, but uh, no, no, not, not any of the uh, entrepreneurs that I uh, interviewed mentioned this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that uh, people are leaving as well. This has been very, very interesting, Nicolas. And uh, perhaps some other time in the future, we can continue with Colombia. Uh, and uh, thank you for coming and thank you for telling us about this, uh, this research and this area. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I forgot to mention the, the article is, a, what is it, open access. Mm -hmm. So you can find it on, on Google, like maybe I can. You, you can write it in, in the chat. Um, yes. Uh, you give me two seconds. I find the link. Um, here it is. Okay, good. So for anybody who's interested, you have the the link to the article you can also contact uh, nicolas of course if you have any other questions on that and uh, uh, and as i said before thank you a lot for this uh, this good uh, conversation with you this good presentation i'm really happy to be here thank you so much for the invitation and me okay it's been a so, very nice experience and i hope everybody enjoyed it yeah, I think I think everybody enjoyed. Thank you.